song because you knew it. So I started this song because there are times when something can be really true and good for some people, yet it sends uh, maybe an unintentional message about God, the kingdom, etc., to others, and that happened to me. See, I heard this song uh, many times as a young child growing up uh, in a Christian home and in church, and it felt like to me it was a funeral dirge, Pastor Stan. It was about a garden, and I didn't like gardens at that time. It was about being alone. I didn't want to be alone. It was about early in the morning. I didn't like to get up early in the morning, and it was also wet outside. It's like that none of that appealed to me, and I thought, that's just not who I am. So you kind of had to struggle through some of those things. And, and then uh, at least at church, we would sing happier songs like, I'll Fly Away. That seemed really, really happy, and we were in it gusto. And then one day, I read the words, in just a few more weary days, and then, I'll fly away. No more sadness, no more sorrow, I'll fly away. The reality is this, that all of human history, let me pray first. Father, I just thank you that as we take these few moments to just to, to share and allow Holy Spirit to literally be that which is speaking to hearts and just kind of opening up through anything that we say and your word as well. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So 
But the reality is that all of human history began in a garden. And not randomly after billions of years, as some would like to say. And it was not just any garden. This was the garden that was created by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, you see it there, Genesis 2.8. The Lord planted a garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. I fear that many times when we read through the Genesis account, it kind of takes on this, oh yeah, that's a story. No, that's what really happened. God planted a garden. And so in this garden were plants and trees and animals, and they were all able to reproduce themselves after their kind. There was also a river in this garden, and so you have this picture of a garden that was also an oasis, because out of that river, other rivers were taking, were flowing out of it as well. And in the center, you, many of you know the story, it had two specifically named trees. One tree was the knowledge of good and evil, and the other was the tree of life. You know, in this garden, God set his crown jewel of all creation. Above the vast universe with billions and billions of stars that we send, heli- uh, we send telescopes into space just so we can see more of them, and we probably still only see a fraction. Above the magnificent sun that would illuminate heat and sustain the garden and the entire earth, his crown jewel is you. You and I, made in his image. Think about it. He creates this amazing world, this amazing garden, and in the, at the highest place of his creation, he puts you, the crown jewel, made in his image. What an incredible beginning, what an amazing setting. And you know, God never wastes anything. He's into recycling, right? He never wastes anything. Took me a while to get into recycling, I have to admit. But even the furnishings of man's first home, the furnishings were a metaphor of what man would be doing in his relationship with God. He would be nurturing, he would be growing, he would be tending it, and also, as the scripture says, protecting it. This is what you and I are called to do in the garden of our own heart. The title of this message, you may have seen it somewhere, uh, is called Garden Life. Because if we're going to live from the inside out, we have to first recognize what is that place, that source of life. So what is garden life? I'm sure there are all kinds of images in your mind right now about gardens, your garden and other garden life. So another unintentional message in my head uh, as I was young and growing up um, that I had to get over about gardens and perhaps similarly maybe some of our perceptions of God. I saw only work and not wonder. I wonder how many of our children just see church as something they have to get ready and go to and do and come back and whatever and, and maybe they're not seeing the wonder of it. Well, that's why we have creative teachers and classes and we pray and we prepare and all of that. So when family comes and your children and your grandchildren are in another room being taught, they're being taught about the wonder of who God is. See, there's a garden in their heart too. And we're trying to work on that and tend that as well. And so I saw work and I didn't see wonder, okay? But as a believer, we ought to, constantly be wowed at what God does. You ever watch some of the nature channels or some of the history channels, specifically nature channels, and you know, it catches your attention, and then you find yourself, I could watch this for hour after hour after hour because it is so full of wonder where we've been able to take high definition cameras and, you know, put them right next to animals that are growing or birds that are eating or flying or, you know, all these different things. This is a great wonder. God is a great wonder in the garden of our heart. I saw toil and not treasure. 
See, in our garden, we had all kinds of stuff. We had, you know, beans, peas, carrots, tomatoes, corn, you know, even things, and a lot of things I didn't even like. But I didn't see it as a treasure. My mom surely did. When that garden came to full bloom and she could go out there and just spend, you know, time before she had to go work in an office, she would be in that garden picking stuff, eating it, doing all kinds of things. I have this cutest little picture and I wish I had found it before now, but it is Charity with her hair was as blonde as can be and she was only that size and she had somebody else's sweatshirt on so it covered her whole body. And here's my mom reaching down and giving her like string beans or something out of the garden because the garden was a treasure. I saw labor (laughs) in the garden. I never wanted to go out there. I saw labor. I didn't see life. And so there was wonder there, there was treasure there, and there was life there, and I just had to grow up to appreciate it. You can all relate, I'm sure. I didn't realize at the time the garden in the natural is a living metaphor of the garden in my own heart. It's a living metaphor. Think about this. The garden sustains all of life. It's necessary for survival. You know, it's not just the grocery stores that provide food. It first comes from somewhere else. We know that. Rice from the garden fields of China. Wheat from the garden fields of the northern plains. Or even potatoes from the vast gardens of my home state of Maine or Iowa. The garden sustains life. Wow, when, when we get in these moments where our spiritual life needs more sustenance, where should we go? We should go to the garden, amen? And the garden was also full of beauty, and this is something I'm trying to get uh, a little more accustomed to because, you know, as a young parent growing up, you're busy taking care of the responsibilities. You're trying to get from point A to point B with all your children intact and bring them home safely. We've one, one or two times, we've left a few and had to go back and retrieve them. I know that's happened before uh, to some of you as well. But this, this beauty of creation opened the eyes of our heart. I was with somebody one time, I won't tell you who it was, and I just simply, we were walking out of a business. We were doing some sales stuff and uh, probably weren't being very successful at it either. And so this just thought came to me, and as we were walking out, there's a little small bird that had flown there beside the flowers, whatever. I just looked over at him and say, God made that. And all of a sudden, he's like, I never really thought of that. I, I, you know, just look at the wonder of that. So the garden is full of beauty, and we can often miss, we can often miss the beauty of the garden of somebody else's life. Somebody else's life and how, how wonderful God has made that person. So the other thing about the garden, I didn't realize, the garden was a meeting place, and some of the previous messages we talked about that, how that God showed up with the very first man and woman in the garden, and he walked through the garden, and he, had, he was there present with them, his presence. We often talk as Christians about the presence of God. And we're talking about the presence of the Father in our heart and our life, the presence of Jesus. You know, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I will give you presence. You will never be left without my presence. Do you always feel it? Perhaps not. But the reality is he wants always to be with us. That's what I was praying before about America. God does not want to be standing a million miles away from America. In fact, he's not. He's in our midst. There's a scripture that says, great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. We need to be saying, America, great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So it was at that meeting place, God shows up in the garden, and it's not just his presence, but it's his voice. That song said, and the voice I hear falling on my ears. See, those who penned that were really talking about a deep experience of meeting with God in the garden, in the garden of their own heart. 
And so he's there. He speaks there. You know, as I was, I was doing this, I thought, what else there? Sometimes we meet our true self in the garden. What am I saying? I'm not trying to be mystical, but it's in this place we go from all of the outside exterior parts of life, all the things that are going on, if we allow ourselves to focus on this relationship with God on our inner, innermost being, in our soul, in our spirit, then we're starting to recognize who we are as well. Sometimes we like it, sometimes we don't, but God's there to help us to fix the things that he doesn't like and we don't like at the same time, and he does it with much grace, much love, and much forgiveness. I thought of this movie. It was an old movie. Uh, it was called Journey to the Center of the Earth. You remember that? So I was kind of thinking that's sometimes uh, we have to do that. Well, maybe often we need to do that. We need to go journey to the center of our own heart and meet with him there. So... The garden was also something else I didn't realize until I started getting a little older and reading scripture and understanding it and having good teachers, that it was a model place. See, because a kid growing up, you know, you read the story, you're taught the story about the Garden of Eden. Okay, that was a good story. You move on to all the other stories. Maybe you like the story about the flood better, you know, Tower of Babel, or maybe you like David and Goliath if you're into violence, you know, whatever you're into, those are the stories you kind of gravitate to. But the model of the garden was this. It was the launching place for everything else. Think about it. God intended that everything else on planet Earth would start and begin right there in the garden, just like the river that flowed out of Eden had its uh, oasis there or its headwaters were right there. A few years ago, uh, we took a team and we were up in someplace in northern Pennsylvania. I forgot the name of the place. Girls probably remember. We were there with Dutch Sheets. It was a prayer journey. But we went to the headwaters of like three or four of major rivers in the United States. And it was just this little tiny trickle. But it was the spring that started that grew into greater and greater rivers, actually grew into, I believe, even the Ohio River because it came down through Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is Abby's hometown, so it's important. Okay. But it all started from there. And later, we would refer to the instruction that was given at, in chapter 1, verse 28, and we often refer to it as the dominion mandate that God said to man, I want you to multiply, I want you to fill this earth, not just with stuff, but with his glory, his will, his purpose, all of the things that, that were there in the garden, and then I want you to govern it. So the garden became a model. It became a launching place. So it sustained life. It was full of beauty. It was a meeting place. And it was a place where life was launched out of. Think about that in the context of your own heart. Place where you meet with God. You know, it, it does include the mind. It does include the spirit. It does include the soul. We are three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And and I'm not going to get into all, all of that, but just, just work with me here. So here we are in 2022, and what does Genesis 1, the Genesis 1 garden, tell us? Not only is it a description of the true beginning and answers to the age-old question, where did I come from? It's about the garden of our heart, our spirit man, the garden of our inner man. So... A few months ago, our entire family went out of town. You're right on that. And so I asked a neighbor to water my garden every day and for about a week. And so she did. I thanked her, gave her a gift card. And uh, why did I do that? Because I knew that if it wasn't tended and watered and nurtured, it would may not be alive when I got home. Or at least it would be uh, very diminished 
uh, it'd probably be dead, let's face it, okay? If you don't water it for about a week, especially after you first planted it. And so the question is, did I, did I really need the four pepper plants that I have there and the six tomato plants that are taking over part of the, you know, the side of the house there, the side of the deck, and the hanging petunia pots there and all of that? No. In fact, I probably spent more money on doing that than if I'd have gone to the farmer's market and just bought fresh vegetables, okay? But what I did need was a living parable, a living metaphor reminding me about tending the garden and the garden of my heart. Because believe me, every morning I get up and I go out and I water those things and, you know, sometimes I'm in a hurry. It's like I'm getting in my car to go somewhere. It's like, oh, I've got to water those. I have to stop that priority and go do another priority. Tend to my little, you guys wouldn't call it a garden. It's kind of an experiment more or less, okay? And there are these great little cherry tomatoes. That's why you can't see them on there. And uh, so I supply food for my family and they love me for it, okay? So, but I needed to be reminded that it requires work, expense, and sacrifice to see the wonder and the work of God that he can do. He can take a seed and transform it into a garden. He does that in you and I. He takes the seed of his word, a truth, he plants it in your heart, and all of a sudden you are growing things. You are visible. You are supplying something. You are being that Eden that is gardenizing the earth. All right. I'm going to switch gears here. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Amen. All right. So the co colorful image that we use to communicate the series Inside Out uh, is from a Disney movie, which is called Inside Out. And I had not watched it literally until like last week. And I had talked to my kids. I said, is this a good movie? Because I'm going to use, you know, some of the imaging from this. And they said, oh, yeah, it's a good movie. So you ought to watch it. And so, of course, I did. Uh, we're not promoting Disney because we know Disney has gone off the rails politically and morally. Okay, so just a little disclaimer there. But this, how many have seen this little movie? Okay, a lot of you. All right, so I'm in good company. This little animation movie takes place in the head of an 11-year-old girl named Riley. And she's got five emotions that they display there. Um, and I'm not a counselor, so I don't know if that's all the emotions there are. There's probably a gazillion more. But she displayed joy, sadness, anger, or fear, excuse me, and disgust. And then the little guy over there on the end is anger. And if you watch the movie, if things got going wrong in Riley's life, anger said, I don't want to do this, but I got to step up. And he'd grab the controls. Go to the next one, if you would. He, there was a control center there. He'd grab the controls, and his head was on fire, and he'd just shove those controls. What, what these emotions were doing, they were, it was a picture of them living on the inside of Riley and seeing all the things going on in her life. And they would step up when it was their time to display a certain emotion. I liked Joy, and she's in the middle. She was one of the main characters. Because the word says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And I think most of us would rather live a joy-filled life than a fear-filled life. Or... Uh, a disgusted life or any of those other emotions or a sad life. In fact, bump it back to the previous PowerPoint. I actually had someone in college that looked just like the sadness person, okay? Take away a little of the animation and the color, but she got filled with the Spirit and it changed her life just like that. It was the most dramatic turnaround I'd ever seen in my life. God does miracles, amen? So, you know... So at this control center, this managing of this inner life, um, I'm catching up to my notes here, just kind of like Nathan, all right? Joy really wanted to be at the control station of the soul all the time. But sometimes life circumstances allowed other characters to step up, whether it was fear, sadness, anger, and disgust. They all saw situations where their emotions should be in charge. Disgust 
actually took over when Riley was a young child um, being fed broccoli. Disgust said, I'm stepping up on this one. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, the child spit out all the broccoli. So disgust took over. I can see why. We are made in the image of God with a mind, with a will, with emotions. And the question is, will we let the Spirit of God, not little animated characters, of course, Holy Spirit, tend the garden of our soul? If I say... Jesus is Lord of my life, then he is in charge of my garden, my inner life, not just this little compartment called my spiritual life that maybe really gets in good focus on Sunday morning or some other time. No, it's that whole being of who I am, body, soul, spirit, and that inner garden of our life, our communion with God where he says, I would like to be the chief gardener of your gardener, and you'll be my assistant, and I'll show you how to garden the garden. See, at my house, you know, I thought I knew a lot. My mother was the chief gardener, okay? She had lots and lots of experience. So she would just tell me, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that. It's probably one of the reasons I didn't like the garden. I didn't want to be told something I didn't want to do anyways. But Holy Spirit, he wants to help us garden our heart because he's taking us somewhere. He's, he's taking us back to these priorities of seeing the life source, the beauty of it, the wonder of it, the survival of it. He's, he's helping us there. And so, you know, body, soul, spirit, and I'm letting him help tend the garden and when I do, my garden looks really great. Have you ever done that? You know, God's been really working on you, and you're, you've been really consistent in your relationship and your fellowship with him, and you're saying, and you're thinking to yourself, because you don't want pride to come in, okay? But you're thinking, this feels really good. My garden feels good. See, Molly has a job of counseling. Her job is to try to help get the garden cleaned up in people's lives, you know, and Many times, she prays with them. Many times, she obviously, she knows what the solution is going in, and God gives her tools. So in this garden, am I willing to forgive? See, a garden that has unforgiveness in it, not really a good-looking garden at all. You know, he wants to show me how to cultivate love in my garden. See, I can be a great person, great to be around, all that kind of stuff. And 1 Corinthians 13 says, if you have not love, you're a clanging gong and a tinkling cymbal. You don't have anything if you don't have love. Today, back in our gathering, we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. That should be in our garden. So in part of the plot, all right, I'll move right along here. Joy, this animated character Joy, and her co-partner Sadness... They go on a journey to restore the soul because important and important memories had gotten lost. They accidentally fumbled the ball. See all those little globes that you see in the background? Those were like the experiences, the memories, the things that happened to them. And they would kind of keep track of them during the day. And the more of the golden ones, which was joy that was there, the better the life was that was going on, okay? And somehow some chaotic thing happened, and they lost some of these emotions, these globes, these experiences. So joy and sadness went on a journey to try to restore the soul. They had been lost. They had been met with uh, some kind of adverse. So in their journey to find them, they're met with adversity and barriers and Simply, they were looking after they found them, they were looking for a way back because they, they were at the control center. But everything else in this person's personality and mind was all these storage places of all these memories and such. Molly's going to correct me after we get done with this message. I know I can just feel it right now. So that was just an animated story that illustrates... We do live from the inside out. Our 
body, soul, spirit, our emotions, our thoughts. And so the Holy Spirit this week has been, the last actually couple weeks, stirring uh, this thought in me, actually this one word, and he keeps bringing it back to me, and it's the word access, access. You can go to that next slide. You know, in the garden, Adam had total and unrestricted access along with a great lifetime assignment. You know that Genesis 128? That was like a lifetime assignment. Here's what you're going to do, Adam. You're going to multiply. You're going to fill the earth. You're going to steward it. You're going to work it. You're going to tend it. You're going to protect it. You're going to guard it. You're going to do all these things out of this garden place. He gave him authority to do it. He gave him the power. Adam had incredible giftings. The tree of life was there for him if he had just gone there first, right? Amen. So his rebellion and disobedience did what? It literally cut off access to this garden, this transcendent source of everything. And most of you will probably know this story. God immediately sets restoration and redemption in place. And as you read through the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, God starts making these covenants. Now, Adam is now out of the garden. He's forced out. Adam and Eve are no longer in the garden, and he's not, uh, not, you know, experiencing that same life and that same fellowship with God. But God does not leave man alone because his very heart is, Raymond, he wants to be with you. He doesn't want to just visit you. He doesn't want to just watch you from afar like you're some kind of experience. No, he wants what he had with Adam. He wants it with Raymond to walk with him and to be with him. So he had to send a sacrifice, a redeemer, Jesus. You know that from the very beginning, that through the arc of history. But what God does, what does he do first? He starts making covenants, these promises and then he starts creating these meeting places. You know, in the, in the tabernacle in the wilderness, what was that? That was a meeting place where God could meet with man on a limited, restricted access. And then that goes on further until it gets to the glory of Solomon's temple and the presence of God so powerful. The priests who had access, they could not stand to minister because God's presence was so glorious in their midst. And so all of this kept going until one day God said, I want my garden back. He made covenants. He made dwelling places. He gave prophets. He gave priests. He gave kings, all of these to to help the people move into their full purpose. In the scripture, in the fullness of time, what did God do? What I just said. He said, I want my garden back. I want my meeting place with my crown jewel of creation. I want that back. So he sent his son, the Lamb of God, to die on the cross and restore un restricted access. You know, this this awareness of access and ability is pictured through the Bible, old and new. You know, in the Old Testament, Isaiah talks about creating a roadway in the wilderness. Make level the pathway. Remove the barriers. He says in the New Testament, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What do keys do? They give you access. They allow you not to Uh, you know, to be restricted at all. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Your assignment has been restored, and it was already quoted during worship. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, so therefore go in my name and disciple the nations, or you could say it this way, gardenize the earth. Take the garden that you experience, take the garden that is now available in your life and start gardenizing the entire world. And resources would never be a problem because his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowing of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God is not short on resources. 
He'll give you resources to do whatever he's called you to do. If you would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak a few things out of Hebrews 10 because I feel like this is the appropriate uh, closing to this first installment of Inside Out about life or garden life. In Hebrews 10, it's probably Paul who's the author here. We don't know for sure, but it sounds like Paul writes like Paul, so we're going to call it Paul's, okay? Some of you said yes, and some of you said no, I don't think so. Okay. But he, he lays out, the writer of Hebrews lays out this amazing blueprint, and what it is is a pathway to unrestricted access to Jesus, unrestricted access to Jesus. He starts off by saying the law could never make one complete of those who draw near. He goes on by saying animal sacrifices yearly could never make perfect or complete those who draw near. And you're familiar with that in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that they had to bring animal sacrifices, especially yearly, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to the priests, and that would atone for that year's worth of sins. But he said it would never make them complete. You get to verse 5, and all of a sudden, I'm in chapter 10, verse 5, it says, therefore, when he comes into the world... At that point, it was a definitive shift. The old order has now gone away, and the new order has come. It took a lot of Jews a whole lot of time to figure that out, and they resisted and resisted and resisted. But he says, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, sacrifices and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sin and sacrifices for sin, thou hast not taken, thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the roll or the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. He goes on to say that in verse 9, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. So he's leading up to, he's leading up to something. Jump to verse 12, if you would. But he Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time on forward until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. Now, these are familiar verses because these verses are also out of the Old Testament as well. For by one offering, his offering, he has perfected or completed for all times those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart. Here he is. He's talking about the heart again. He's talking about the garden place. He's talking about the inner you and I, that the real ways of God, the laws of God, the desires of God, the purposes of God, He's now not just going to write them on stone tablets so that it'll be, here's the law. No, he's writing them now in our garden, in our hearts. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, therefore, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. So, He's basically saying, I have done all this, okay? This is the whole, he's rehearsing what Jesus had done, what the Father and what through the ages had been prophesied, what the priesthood was doing, now what Jesus was doing. And now you get to verse 19, and this ought to fire anybody up. And just read it, you've probably read it many times. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. I'm going to pause right there. Since therefore, brethren... We have confidence. You know, you might be here today and, and you say, well, 
I'm not one of these believers that really feel secure in my faith. This scripture says, if you believe in the work that Jesus did on the cross, then now by his blood, you can have confidence. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I asked, to, I, I talked about building, that God's building something. He's building something in your life, okay? He's building stuff in his church. He's building us together. And what he builds, he inhabits, right? He builds, uh, you know, a, a place, a people for his glory to inhabit. He builds your life so he can inhabit it with more and more of his presence and ways and glories, okay? So I gave you the assignment. I don't know if anybody took the assignment or not. I said, just think of one thing that you want God to be building in your life. Mine was confidence. I said, Lord, I want more confidence. Now, I can seem confident because I'm up here in front of you. Uh, I could be scared spitless, and you don't even know it, okay? But I asked the Lord for confidence, and I love this scripture as I was doing this message, that brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way. Let me pause right there. That word for new is an interesting Hebrew word because it means freshly slaughtered, followed by the next word, a new and living way, the mystery of God the beauty, the wonder of who God is, that he would send his son, and now you have this author saying, a new, a freshly slaughtered, and a living way, and that way is, means roadway or pathway, which he's inaugurated for us. That inauguration means he's dedicated for us. It is unprecedented. This word means it's a renewing kind of word because it has the word kainos in it, which is that Greek word for new, unprecedented, never seen before, to enter the holy place, this new and living way that he's inaugurated for us through the veil. There again, it's another image. That veil was in the holy place in the temple that only the priest could go beyond the veil once a year with the blood. You all know that. And Jesus comes as the perfect lamb with his own blood. He went into the heavens to the mercy seat beyond the veil in heaven and that atonement is there now, and we have confidence to enter in. Amen? For us, through the veil, what is that veil? Through his flesh. And now, since we have a great high priest, you have your own personal great high priest. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith. Some days, you may not feel like you have full assurance of faith. You know what you have to say? I don't care how I feel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in truth. I'm going to let my emotions catch up with me. I don't care what's going on back here. These animated characters in my head, they'll figure it out. I'm trusting and I'm looking at the word and this is who I am. I have full assurance of faith. I have confidence. He's inaugurated a new and a living way. And so I'm going to respond to this call to draw near, to draw near. I, I, I just remember some of the old books that I'd read. One of them was Jud Judson Cornwall, just this magnificent uh, storyteller, preacher, uh, just unfolding scripture, unfolding, you know, God's purpose and plan. And one of his books was called, Let Us Draw Near. He laid out the Old Testament, you know, priesthood and all that was there. And then he brought that reality of, of now Christ living in us. And now we had unrestricted access. Full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. You know what's so great about this? Yes, it's a one-time, it's a first-time experience when you ask Jesus to come into your life, that he sprinkles with his blood, that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that he forgives us of our sin, and all of that. But then as we're going through life, could be the next day or the next hour, 
you know? If we sin, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just. What does that mean? Well, faithful means he'll always do it. Just means he's justified. It's more of a legal term. He's just. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm so glad you guys did the evangelism uh, thing to stoke those fires in us and to point us and paddle us back into a, a direction, you know, because that's part of our fivefold gifting apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. And all those dimensions need to be in the local church and, and live in us and making disciples. Where am I? I'm going to close here in just a moment. Just let us draw near. So the garden, after Adam was thrust out of the garden, Adam and Eve, you remember what he put at the entrance of that garden? Angels, or an angel, one, two, I didn't go back and check, with a flaming sword so that he couldn't go back into that garden. That's a very sad picture when you think about the, what the original intent of that garden was. Jesus came and gave us access back into God's garden. And God's garden is first and foremost right here in our lives, getting our lives back into his purpose, cleaning us up, for dealing with our sin issue, all of that. We don't get become perfect. We become complete in him, and we can, on a regular basis, um, be washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus by confessing our sins and and just as I already read, 1 John 1, 9, you might want to write that down. Maybe you want to tattoo it on your arm. I don't know. Some people have lots of scriptures tattooed. Um, I heard one guy say, I, I do tattoos, but I'm just afraid where they'd end up later on in life, you know. Jesus didn't die just to take away our sin. He did that, but he died to give us a new in a living way. And so I'm thinking through this. I'll hold my notes so I don't forget where I am. You know, he did it for the unlikely. He did it for the unlovely. And he did it for the undeserving. So we're all candidates. We're unlikely, unlovely in our sin, and undeserving. And he did it to get us back to his garden. You know, there's a parable about the wedding feast and a, a man was throwing a big wedding and uh, he had an exclusive invitation list and only a handful responded. Some of them were just too busy. They had stuff going on. And so the man hears about, uh, these people aren't coming. These high up people aren't coming. So what did he say? He say, Go to the highways, go to the byways, and compel them to come in. What was Jesus illustrating in that? His heart is for the whole world. His heart is not just for a handful of church people that get cleaned up and, and uh, you know, get to heaven somehow. He, he's after all. So I'm going to end this. I brought this sword down earlier because the pathway to the garden may require some of this what am I saying I'm not saying you need a sword to uh, you know fight off you know people in your life but the word says he gives us the sword of the spirit right it's a double-edged sword and that word for double-edged means two voices and uh, I've always thought and I guess it's probably appropriate it's God's voice and our voice okay and that God's voice has already spoken through his word, and when I speak his word, I'm speaking his voice. And, but the picture I want to leave you with before we dismiss is that it's not as easy as we think to get back to the garden. And I'm not talking about a one-time journey. I'm talking about daily. I'm talking about that place where you fellowship. Now, for some people, it's a specific location with a specific cup of coffee, you know, with specific music playing. It doesn't matter how you get there, okay? God doesn't care about the accessories or the environment. What he wants is me 
fellowshipping with him and that presence and voice taking place. But you know what? I may have to pick up this sword and do some warfare against my own flesh, against cultural worldly stuff that wants to consume my life and my time and my attention and satanic or demonic forces that want to attack and try to take me off course from maintaining that relationship with him. I may have to pick up the sword and just get a little bit aggressive. See, uh, I went you know, I went from college to Bible school, so I was in this incubator with everybody saying, hi, brother, isn't Jesus good? And prayer was taking place, and worship was taking place, and it was a greenhouse, okay? It was a good greenhouse. It had purpose and strategy and all that. And then I went on staff at this wonderful church with high-level people, okay? A little intimidating, still is, okay? And so there were times when I was so busy with children and life and church and whatever and my garden didn't look very good, Mike. My garden was like, and, but, and so I felt in a good way, and I want you to feel it too, the positive pressure, even from this message, to say, my number one priority in life is not whether my car gets washed, or I watch this TV series, or I go buy these clothes, or I do this. My number one priority is first and foremost the garden that God has set aside for he and I to fellowship in. That is priority number one. And so I was smart enough and I knew enough, I've got to stay on priority number one. And I still have to do that. I still have to pick up the sword. And I remember this one time, well, there was many times, this one time was a specific place. It sticks in my mind, kind of like one of those little globes in the, you know, the Inside Out movie. It's, it's parked there on a shelf. I remember it vividly. I drove like four or five miles away from where I lived out into the country and parked along a roadside and went down into a ravine in Texas. They don't have trees. They just have bushes and vines and all kinds of crazy, probably a lot of snakes that I was not aware of, all of that. And I, I did that because I was desperate. I was saying, I need to war. I need to meet with God. And God, whatever it takes. You know, and I don't think that I even came out of that ravine feeling anything, but I know that God saw my heart. And he knew that I was hungry. And so I just want to leave you with this today. You might be here and, and you may say, you know, I've never really had a relationship with God. I wouldn't call myself a believer. I, I may have gone to church, may have even said a prayer, but didn't really know what I was doing. And if you want a relationship with God today, worship team, would you come down, please? Not worship team, excuse me, prayer team. And just come down and join me right here. And you may say, you know what, Pastor? What you said, you're speaking to me, that I need Jesus in my life. Amen. And my, don't, my garden looks like a graveyard, okay? And I want there to be life there. Jesus came out of the grave so that he could bring us back to the garden, amen? amen. And so, or you may just be here today and you may say, you know what, I'm just stirred and I'm just going, I just want to make a faith step and go down and pray with someone and say, agree with me that I would have the sword that I need to cut through the stuff of life and manage that garden. Because that's, that was God's intention from the very beginning, that we be people of his garden. Amen? Go ahead and put the video song up there. Stand up, if you would, with me. There's a, a video, and it's actually the song we sang during service. It's called, Here I Bow. You can turn some of the lights down. If you want to come up while this song is playing, please do. This is your invitation. If you don't know Jesus, you've never made that faith step. There isn't a person in here would think any less of anybody for coming up here to pray about anything. We celebrate those who say, I, I want more passion. I want more breakthrough. Thank you, Lord. So beautiful. You can sing with it. So he I bow to lift you high. Jesus, be glorified in all things for all my life. I am yours forever yours. There is a king.
can play that again just a little bit lower I'm going to close in prayer and this ministry takes place up here if you want to come and join please do so if you just want to come down and play pray at the altar uh, we'd love to do that Lord I believe that you are gardenizing our hearts Lord we 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 think about and we talk about warring for this nation and how important that is, warring for other nations spiritually. But Lord, how insignificant and important it is, is to warring, Lord, first and foremost for the garden of our own heart. And so, Lord, I ask that you would just stir inside of each one today a fresh passion to say, I'm going to meet with him in the garden of my heart. I'm going to see him, Lord, tend and stir and grow the things of his kingdom in my life. And Lord, I thank you for giving each one, Lord, the, to, the ability to war for their time, their discipline, faith, all of those things, Lord, that make up part of our life. And Lord, if there's someone here today that is making a decision to make you Savior, Lord, and King of their life, I ask, Lord, that they would just completely surrender and open their heart today to make Jesus Lord. So, Father, we speak blessing over this house today. Each one here, they would go with great grace into the harvest field, into their homes, into their lives. We ask for your divine protection Lord, I just say the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, and the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. Amen.
Amen.